Our last speaker of four is the, the iron fist of regulation. No, I don't mean that. Gordon has been patiently listening to our other speakers. Uh, he is chairman of the MHRA, and of course a responsive regulatory system is key to the introduction of the sort of innovation that we want to see. Gordon, thank you so much. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, John. And uh, may I say, I think this is a great uh, format. Of, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, although how you could tell I was waiting patiently, I don't know. That's only something I know. Um, but um, uh, you were quite right to use your sort of analogy of the iron fist of the regulator because, sadly, that's the image that gets put about. And what I hope to persuade you in the next 15 minutes is it's totally erroneous. Uh, there is uh, developers really have no better friend than the regulator. So I was asked to talk about the key challenges, and there are several. Um, and the first and foremost is probably the one that Malcolm ended up with quite uh, reasonably, which was the, the rate at which science is developing and the different types of sciences relevant to medicine, relevant to development of medicines and medical devices generally, is, is, is unprecedented. We know about the omics, I won't rehearse the individual bits of the science, but I mean, for example, we were all very excited five, six years ago by the concept of the, the whole uh, genome association study. Um, which now, with, when you, which was still based on, on proxy information, um, but when you now consider that we can do whole genome sequencing studies in quite large populations, it makes old GWAS seem uh, Dickensian. Um, so these, these things will impact medicines development and medicines regulation. Phenomics have been mentioned, that's going to be huge as well. Stem cells, cell biology, the alteration of cells in vitro and in vivo, uh, and long-lasting genetic changes will be a real challenge to us. The second challenge is that there will be lots of new types of products based on engineering and these scientific advances. There will be combination products, products that are both devices and medicines. We already have the drug eluting stents, that things like that will continue and become increasingly complex. We have things like drugs given in association with matrices and, and biocompatible materials. It's another area. We will have to consider how we deal with tandem diagnostics. That is a biomarker test, genetic or otherwise, that gives you the access to a particular medicine or not. And the regulator has to decide what sort of evidence will be needed for that combination. And as the regulator has to decide with every new product, are the benefits going to outweigh the risks? We also have the new cellular and genetic therapies, which I think you all uh, will probably be pretty familiar with. Another big challenge to us is the changing expectation of our stakeholders. Um, the public, our major stakeholder, has a rapidly changing expectation of the regulator. Public want faster, better, cheaper remedies, uh, but they also have a very low tolerance for any kind of risk. And you put those things together, and you really are facing quite a challenge. But the patient voice must be heard more loudly in the regulatory process. We need patients to tell us um, what they consider a positive benefit-risk ratio and not uh, a lot of experts sitting around a table um, knocking it out uh, um, between themselves. So the patient voice in regulation and patient-reported endpoints in clinical trials or other sorts of testing of, of new remedies I think will be, is a big challenge for us and must, we must go ahead with it. Another challenge is that we are being charged now to extend slightly beyond a purely regulatory role and almost have a wealth-creating support agenda, which is fine. We should be facilitatory rather than be an obstacle to the development of important public health products in this country and elsewhere. A rather big challenge is the globalization of the things that we regulate. 
the devices and the medicines. We have extremely long supply chains. We have production plants at the other side of the world. And we as regulators have a responsibility for what goes on in those places. So that is a massive challenge, the challenge of globalization of production. So what are our responses and how are we teeing ourselves up to be able adequately and perhaps better than adequately to cope with a rapidly changing world? The first is that we want to develop an ethos of a risk-based approach to our regulation. Um, if somebody asks to do something which is not that different from normal uh, medical care, then the level of regulation needn't be and shouldn't be the same as if somebody wants to introduce a completely new chemical entity or biological medicine. So risk-based approaches both to medicines regulation and to, and to uh, devices regulation. Our other response is to take care of our scientific base. We as regulators need to understand the science that people are using to make the products that we are going to be asked to regulate. And one of the ways that we've done that is we have merged with our National Institute of Biological Standards and Control, NIBSC, up at South Mims. It's a fabulous place. If you've never been there, look it up on Google and uh, ask for a visit. It's absolutely one of the jewels in the um, bioscience, biomedical science crowns in the UK. It still today supplies the entire world, the entire world, with 97% of its biological standards for new vaccines, new medicines in the biological field. So at NIBSC, we have developed a new division called Advanced Therapeutics, and we've got Mary Collins um, from uh, your institute, John, on a secondment to run that for us. Uh, we've also had Sir Patrick Sissons review the scientific uh, policies and, and procedures at NIBSC, and his review has been very positively received. Our other response is we have something called the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, CPRD, which is something that has evolved from the General Practice Research Database. It is the largest, best curated uh, data set uh, for longitudinal follow-up of uh, seven to eight million individuals in the world. Uh, we've been, it's been used for 25 years. Um, it ha it's anonymized, but it has myriad important uses uh, for us and for the health community generally. It's excellent for both observational and interventional type studies, uh, epidemiology, um, selecting, seeing if you have the sort of patients you need to do a clinical trial in the UK and so forth. I hesitate to mention the um, Health and Social Care uh, Information Center at Leeds. Um, that's sort of hit the debacle, the wall of the debacle of, uh, of, of public anxiety. Um, the real question is, is, is not, um, is, uh, is the database at Leeds secure? How can it be if somebody can hack into you know, the, the, the most secret database in America? The real question is, will my data be any less secure there than it is now? And I think if people really understand that, that the question there, a lot of the anxiety will go away. In devices, as I've said, we have a very large challenge, um, and we've just completely overhauled recently our uh, um, ability to access the best scientific advice. So we have an internal uh, group, um, but that, that internal group is outward looking, links with the Royal Colleges, the specialist societies, so that in real time um, and ahead of time, not always in response mode, uh, scanning for new risks and how we will cope with them in our regulation. I'm very pleased with that as well. And in our uh, licensing division, we have set up an innovation center where you can get pre-filing advice, uh, very important particularly for academics, Nancy, and for NHS people who want to develop uh, new ideas and products. Um, that is a, uh, oh, it's open, it's pretty much free to, to academics and NHS. There's a small charge for, for in, industry uh, colleagues. Um, the, the 
Uh, other important thing about that is if you want, you can have a joint meeting um, with us and with NICE so that you can, at the very beginning of a project, figure out all the different pathways uh, that you could go and get advice on which might be the best pathway to take. We will be as facilitator as possible, but we cannot ever be even close to the position of seeming like we're sponsoring a project, but we want to facilitate. Um, we are also using CPRD and our vigilance and risk management to uh, examine uh, real-life safety and efficacy of drugs in normal use in the NHS and out there. So real-life databases in CPRD, important not just for examining safety signals or detecting safety signals, but for checking that efficacy is there, that it's, that it's actually doing any good. For example, most of the vaccines that, uh, that go on the market that we regulate most of the vaccines get through the regulatory process based on immunogenicity, surrogate markers uh, of uh, protection. And it's only when they're used out there, uh, uh, when, they're when people are being challenged, that you get the data that they are actually also efficacious. So currently, I'm going to stop in a minute, currently we have, uh, we're very actively engaged with the Early Access to Medicines scheme, which was rolled out last week. <coughs> MHRA has had a very leading role in pushing that through. It's a two-phase um, scheme that allows patients uh, where there is unmet clinical need to get new innovative medicines while they remain unlicensed. Um, and then we're also very involved, that's a UK um, initiative. At the European level, we've taken a, a, a quite an active role in the adaptive licensing uh, um, announcement that, that was just made last week and will be implemented probably uh, in 2015. And we've taken a pretty much a lead role in the European new clinical trial regulation, all of which we can talk about later. So to sum up, the agency is trying your agency, the UK agency, is trying to be agile and nimble to look ahead to see what might be coming down towards us in the way of challenges and to begin now uh, to be in a position to meet them. Um, what we want to do is become as facilitatory as we can. We want to be interactive with our stakeholders. We want to support innovation uh, while at the same time fulfilling our fundamental remit of safeguarding uh, the public health and the health of uh, every man, woman, and child in the UK. Thank you.